was videotaping the, the authors for the TV series. You're watching Book TV, 48 hours of books, authors, and the publishing industry. Every weekend on C-SPAN 2, from Saturday morning at 8 until Monday morning at 8 Eastern. Andrew Sullivan, senior editor of The New Republic, wrote this book, Love Undetectable, about his experience of being diagnosed with the HIV virus. It also touches on his views on love and friendship in the homosexual and heterosexual communities. He talks about the book and its background next as we take you to the Ravaga Art Gallery in Washington, D.C. Welcome to Ravaga Art. I'm Joel Gregorio. Ravaga Art provides an affirming venue, a space where artistic expression, whether painted or written, can be experienced equally by the gay, lesbian, and straight community. We're very pleased to provide an opportunity tonight to hear from a thought-provoking member of our community, Andrew Sullivan. Andrew Sullivan is a senior editor of The New Republic, editor of same-sex marriage pro and con, author of Virtually Normal, an argument about homosexuality. And here tonight is to read from his Love Undetectable, his new book. Andrew Sullivan, welcome to Andrew. Thanks very much for coming. Um, usually at these things I, I sort of have a uh, sort of free-for-all discussion, but since this is somewhat literary, um, a book, certainly more writerly than anything else I've written, I think I probably should read from it. Um, first of all, what the book is, is really um, three essays. I always wanted to write a book about friendship, and when my agent came to me and said, we want another book, I said, well, I'd kind of like to write a book about that. I, I'd read a lot of uh, political theory at grad school, and one of the things that always amazed me was that all the great philosophers, the ancient and medieval ones particularly, always had a huge amount to say about friendship. And yet this was a subject that our modern society never really dealt with at all. It was sort of taken for granted. And in my own life as well, friendship was so much more important to me or had become more important to me than romantic love, the thing that our culture says is so vital and so important for a meaningful life. So I thought there was plenty of material there and accepted a contract and went to work. And, uh, and then a strange thing happened, which was that these new drugs came out for HIV, and uh, my own diagnosis was transformed in a matter of months, along with many others, and I felt as a writer and as a journalist, I had to write about that as it was happening, and I wasn't going to actually wait until this was old news before I wrote about it. So I wrote a piece for the New York Times Magazine two years ago called When Plagues End which turned out to be highly controversial. It said that essentially a chapter in this epidemic was over and a new one was beginning. And there was such a brouhaha about it that my agent and publisher said, you know, you should really write a book about that. That's the hot story. That's what you should cover. That's what you've written about. So I naively said, okay, I'll do that too. And I got another book contract and I went away for Christmas at you to figure out what I was going to do with these two books. And then I realized over New Year that they were the same book, that I couldn't write about friendship without writing about what the plague had done in illuminating for me what friendship really was. And I couldn't write about the plague without writing about friendship. So I constructed a book that would try to be about both things. And as I did that, too, I realized that I couldn't write about the plague without writing about the most fundamental questions of shame and fear and guilt that it had inspired in me and others. And so I came to write about the origins of homosexuality and why it was that when I found out that I was HIV positive, 
my first reaction was not so much fear as shame. And why that also, I think, if we're being honest, was a response that many other people had as well. And I felt that if we were going to come out of this, if it was going to end at least as a trauma, if not as a way of life, I'm still taking pills, um, then we should try and get at some of the shame that had both fueled the epidemic and sustained it and was still part of our minds and souls even as it seemed to abate. And I say this on the day that the CDC announced that last year saw the sharpest drop in deaths from HIV than any previous year and sharper than any drop in any epidemic in the history of America. So when plagues end, is a part of that book I stand by. So the book came out of that. Love Undetectable is the title. Undetectable, of course, is what they say our virus is. Your virus is now undetectable in your blood. And it's also what gay men often were in our society. It's what the shame has been often, although it's been very real. And I think it fueled the pressure for intimacy, which became promiscuity, which became disease in the beginning of this epidemic. I also think it's a synonym for friendship itself, a love that is often undetectable by our culture and our society, but something that we feel and understand and experience. Well, since this is DC, and this is where I live, and since, unlike almost any other reading, when I look out, I can see friends of mine. And since this is the uh, city where a lot of the events in this book happen, I'm going to read just a few passages about a person who lived here. Um, and I think a lot of people who think of D.C. think of it as this ridiculous place where impeachment hearings are voted on and committees meet and lobbying groups uh, lobby. They don't often see the other side of Washington, which is full of ordinary people living and dying, as they did. And the book is dedicated to this guy. His name was um, Patrick May, and he lived here. And people in this room remember him, too. Uh, so I'll read just a couple of passages, because this book really has the frame of a story of that friendship and how it grew and developed and how it ended. I'll start from the beginning. First, the resistance to memory. I arrived late at the hospital fresh off the plane. It was around 8.30 and there was no light on in my friend Patrick's apartment, so I went straight to the intensive care unit. When I arrived, my friend Chris's eyes were red and blear of fright. The hospital mask slipped down under his chin. I went into the room. When I first caught sight of Pat, he was lying on his back, his body contorted so his neck twisted away and his arms splayed out, his hands palm upward showing the intravenous tubes into his wrists. Blood mingled with sweat in the creases of his neck, his chest heaving up and down grotesquely with the pumping of the respirator, a huge plastic tube forced down his throat. His cold feet poked out from under the bedspread as if separate from the rest of his body. The week before, celebrating his 31st birthday in his hometown in the Gulf Coast of Florida, we had swum together in the dark, warm space he'd already decided would one day contain his ashes. It was clear that he'd known that something was about to happen. One afternoon on the beach, he'd gotten up to take a walk with his newly acquired beagle and had glanced back at me a second before he left. All I can say is that somehow the glance conveyed a complete sense of finality, the subtlest but clearest sign that it was, as far as he was concerned, over. Within three days, a massive fungal infection overtook his lungs, and at midnight, the vital signs began to plummet. I remember walking slowly back to the intensive care room when a sudden rush of people moved backwards out of the room. His brother motioned to the rest of us to run, and we sped toward him. 
Pat's heart had stopped beating. After one attempt to restart it, we surrounded him and prayed. His mother and father and three brothers, his boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, and a handful of close friends. When the priest arrived, each of us received communion. I remember I slumped back against the wall at the moment of his dying, reaching out for all the consolation I'd been used to reaching for, the knowledge that the worst was yet to come, the memory of pain survived in the past, but since it was happening now, and now had never felt so unavoidable, no relief was possible. Perhaps this is why so many of us have found it hard to accept that this ordeal may be over, because it means we may now be required to relent from our clenching against the future and remember the past. It's only perhaps when you absorb the notion that someone is truly your equal, truly interchangeable with you, that the death of another makes mortality real. It's as if only in the death of a friend that a true reckoning with mortality is ever made before it's too late, which is why so many theologians for so long saw friendship as an integral and vital part of a truly spiritual life. With Patrick, death swept away the mystery of our friendship and exposed its raw existence. The friendship articulated itself fully in my mind at the moment that it ceased to exist. We were as like as we were unlike. Patrick was a big-boned, apple-cheeked, red-headed bruiser of a man, a southerner with an immense capacity to charm and infuriate. My first sight of him before I'd ever met him was watching him stride across, across DuPont Circle, shirtless, with a huge metal bicycle chain draped around his neck like a python. I've been told about him by a mutual friend who'd known him since college and who thought we would get along. When I eventually got to know him, I began to see why. He'd read everything, it seemed. All of Faulkner, twice over at least, obscure works by Gide, an obscure historical text on the Civil War, he taught himself to play the piano and relax, listening to Marin McPartland and Arvo Pert. Obsessed with food, he cooked vast, fatty, flowery meals, a new Rilke in the original German. He laughed mischievously, made up stories, was prone to sudden violent bursts of temper, and hardly ever answered the phone. He was a deeply proud person and fearless, a rebel who revered authority a sexual adventurer who treasured love, a traditionalist who rarely gave up a chance to try something new. Patrick struck so many chords within me over the few years I knew him that it seemed truly as if the world were less lonely with him in it. And to begin with, of course, I fell in love with him. Most of us did. He didn't allow many people into his intimate life, and the few of us who were privileged to be there was soon forced to tolerate some of the worst varieties of emotional manipulation, but we did so gladly. He drew us to him and kept us there, despite indignities and rudenesses and peremptory withdrawals. The charm was almost hypnotic, and there was a sweet serenity about it. Of course, he was already romantically involved, with more than one person, it turned out. And there came that in Our connection was about friendship, not love. And the kind of attachment I'd begun to feel for him was something about which he could feel only ambivalence, not surety. He told me this on the street at night. With tears in his eyes, his chubby face choking with sad transparency. In a world in which emotion is increasingly strained through the filter of self-marking, Patrick never stinted in his feeling. It was direct and real and old, and his love was at times overpowering. And that love was no less love for being in the form of friendship. We've come to dread that moment when a date or a lover turns to us and says, let's be friends. But that dread is often a misplaced one. 
Patrick in the first regard taught me that. We would have been hopeless lovers, far too headstrong to tolerate each other's constant company, far too individual to have merged into one. But as friends, we had space to breathe, to be ourselves. And by being ourselves in the company of each other, we helped each other ease more deeply into what we thought were our futures. We gave one another confidence, confidence to resist the categories into which society wanted to shoehorn us, confidence to risk too much in exploring our world, confidence to return to our somewhat estranged families and reconcile ourselves to their love. For months and then years, this friendship continued, occasionally fading and sometimes unexpectedly crackling. But then it changed or slipped into another dimension or intensified so dramatically that it seemed to take on a qualitatively different form. It was almost as if we felt it coming. In the summer that I'd been diagnosed with HIV, Patrick had momentarily disappeared. This wasn't particularly strange. For days and sometimes weeks at a time, Pat would simply drop out of sight, fail to return calls, or just absent himself from social duties. But this absence had come after a particularly difficult conversation we'd had. We'd sat on the floor in my apartment and talked about the disease that stalked both of us. Pat rarely talked about it and had never gotten tested. I'd just gotten my results and was still in shock. Fearful of telling anyone, I'd even kept the news from Patrick. But I needed to be near him somehow and to talk, even in code, about the fear that was consuming me. I remember how hard it was to lie to him or not to tell him everything. For the first time in our friendship, I kept something back, pinioned by the disease and the shame and the terror of exposure into compromising our mutual honesty in protecting myself from my friend's protection. But he seemed intuitively to understand and oddly enough to talk about his own fears. Sometimes he said, it feels like some bogeyman in the forest waiting to pounce on my back. Sometimes I wish it would just because then I'd know where it was and I'd know how to fight it. It would be in front of me and I'd know what to do. I really wish I had it somehow. It would be less frightening than not knowing. And within a few weeks of that conversation, Pat was hospitalized with AIDS-related pneumonia. I didn't know about his illness at first because, like me, he decided to keep it to himself. In this, we both participated in one of the unsung rites of AIDS. Not so much the fear or the shame, but the fusion of the two, the uniquely isolating and self-punishing crucible in which the disease often announces itself. But after a month or two of not seeing him or getting my many calls returned, I spotted him in his usual place at mass and noticed he looked remarkably thinner. When I tried to catch his eye, he bent down in prayer. And after communion, after my own prayers, when I looked up to go to that part of the church to talk to him, he'd suddenly disappeared. He was avoiding me. Then a few days later, he called me at my office and said he wanted to talk to me about something. It was serious, he said. I told him I wanted to talk to him, too. I, too, had something difficult to tell him. There had been for both of us a slow erosion in the wall of discretion we constructed between us. We went a few blocks away at a fountain in a park. You probably all know where it is. And told each other with mounting disbelief the same piece of news. And in the muggy haze of a Washington summer afternoon, the friendship began again. Whatever barriers and boundaries there had been between us until that moment suddenly dissolved into something much more like union, solidarity, relief. So much relief. We were at that moment each other's only HB positive friend, each other's only confident in the same tribulation. And what we had previously had in common swiftly seemed trivial in comparison. Pat wrote me later that summer about how he felt. He wrote, with all that's happened to us, together and apart, I'm inclined to think that somehow we were chosen. Oh, 
to know each other, to help sustain each other, and to teach each other about the mysteries of loving, living, dying. After the initial crush of your news, when I had been prepared not to receive but to give a report on my HIV status to you, I found myself grown strangely more attached and connected to you, even protective of you. And I felt an effusion of love and tenderness that for the first time since I met you was not constrained by considerations of others, of anything or anyone other than you and me and our feelings for one another. Somehow I was able to love you wholly and this gave me great strength to face the greatest fears I have known. How is it that such news can clear an immediate path between us, sweep away the debris and the impediments? Now, I don't know how the letter continued, because he never sent it to me. And that's the only page I have. It was found in his possessions a year or so after his death. Perhaps he felt it unnecessary in the end to say it to me and merely needed to prove it to himself. The reticence of friendship again. Or perhaps the feeling was powerful and true only for that moment and seemed excessive in retrospect. But it was, I think, nevertheless real, at least for a moment. And I felt it too. Sorry. That's all I'll read for the time being. Um, and I'll take questions. So I haven't actually read that aloud since I wrote it. And um, it's a strange thing to relive. <sighs> Didn't really leave you much space for questions. So I'm happy to take any questions about marriage, gay politics, um, friendship, love, psychoanalysis. <laughs> AIDS. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, the middle section of the book is called Virtually Abnormal, um, and it's really an attempt to get at the core of um, the cure therapists who are currently, next week, going to launch a new TV campaign of ads that gay people are sick and diseased and need to be cured. And actually, I went to a conservative conference about two years ago where this was clearly part of the religious rights new agenda. Many of the therapists were there. And that's sort of what partly sort of tipped me off about what was coming. So I went back and read all these people that I could find. Uh, I read most of the papers that they delivered in the last few years at their major conferences and read most of the serious books. And then I went back and read Freud himself and the, the early psychoanalytic literature on what makes you gay. And in the book, what I try and do, rather like I did in Virtually Normal in this part, is actually to present this argument as persuasively as I could, so as to see it at its best. Um, and I actually was kind of struck by some of the case studies and some of the stories that these therapists retailed, because they actually resonated somewhat with my own experience and with many other people's experiences. And I wanted the classic early childhood development of a, of a gay son who tends to have a very strong attachment to his mother, a somewhat distant relationship with his father and develops in that way. And a lot of us, I think, were somewhat, I think, nervous of even going here. And the knee-jerk hostility in response to this particular campaign suggests how, how difficult a subject it still is. What I try and do in the book is to say, well, maybe there's something to this. Maybe, in fact, there's some genetic predisposition, but also maybe in the first 18 months to three years of development, there is some kind of relationship between the child and mother and father that might conceivably have a role to play in the development of a homosexual orientation, just as a different relationship between a child and parents might have a role to play 
in the development of a heterosexual orientation. This is something that Freud also believed. He thought that heterosexuality needed to be explained as much as homosexuality. But so what? <laughs> the question to me was, what if that is true? What conceivably follows from that? Does it follow from that that gay people cannot love one another? Does it follow from that that they have a bad relationship with their parents? Does it follow from that that because homosexuality may have some environmental influence in your early years that it's chosen? None of those things follow. So what I try and do in that part of the book is to lay out the arguments for that case and show why the notion that that might be true could completely be compatible with the notion that homosexuality is healthy, perfectly normal for people who are gay, capable of being a loving and non-pathological orientation, and also something that people don't choose. People say, do you believe homosexuality is genetic or do you think it's chosen? Well, what about it not being entirely genetic, but being also environmental in the very first years of your life and still not being chosen? What about being environmental and not being chosen? That's an option which I think may actually be closer to the truth. Now, the key person who has forged a lot of this stuff to answer your question is called Richard Sarkarides. Um, I'm not Richard Sarkarides, excuse me, Charles Sarkarides. Richard Sarkarides is the White House liaison to the gay and lesbian community. Um, although they're related, that's his son. Um, the chief psychoanalyst who has pioneered the notion that parents make their children gay has a gay son. Uh, not just a gay son, but the most prominent gay lesbian member of the Clinton administration. Um, not counting people that we're not allowed to mention. Um, certainly not on C-SPAN. Um, you can't, believe it or not, reproduce these people's work without their permission. I hadn't realized this until I wrote a book. You have to like go through enormous legal loopholes to ask them to reproduce their work. And some very bright spark at Alfred A. Knopf decided not only to send him the passages I wanted to quote, but the pages on which the quotes appear, which have all sorts of critical remarks about his particular research. So of course he had you know, a very large cow and said he would refuse to give me permission. However, there is fair use of a certain minimal amount. I wish I had been able to quote more from him because I think it's important to listen to their words in their own language. And I think that if and when he reads the final book, he'll see that I've bent over backwards to be fair and honest to these people's work and to separate out what may be bigoted and hateful about it from what might actually be true about it. In fact, I think given what I've written, I'm amazed I'm not going to be more attacked from the geneticists than I am from, from that side. But I don't think we have anything to fear from these people. I don't think we have anything to fear from the notion that early emotional development might have a role to play in the development of homosexuality. And the fact that we are so afraid of these people suggests that in fact the problem is not our homosexual orientation, but our lingering shame and fear. That we are still afraid that we might actually be gay because of our relationship with our mother or father in the very earliest months of our life. Well, what is wrong with it? <laughs> Do, are we still ashamed of that particular relationship, a mother's love? And most of these therapists also say, in a way that I think most people don't really concede, that this is fixed by the time of 18 months or three years. That's very early. And most of them concede it can't really be changed except with enormous effort, and even then, it's really play-acting. I mean, the homosexuals that claim to be cured are just, have learned how to act like heterosexuals without enormous internal conflict. That's success. <laughs> um, but I think these people, in some ways, if you go to the, the, the opponents and read their arguments, you can often find stuff there that's much, not, much more surprising and interesting than you might think, and actually doesn't lead to their conclusions. We shouldn't let them get away with saying they're representing Freud, for example. They're not. They're distorting Freud. Um, and for anybody who hasn't read Freud on this stuff, I really recommend it. I'd never read it. And it's a revelation. It's an incredibly good writer, really smart and interesting. It says things about homosexuality that other people in this climate are too afraid to say. Come on. You're all... Um, yeah. Of the middle of your book, 
you develop a lot of arguments about uh, male, the gay male society that right. it's, not, it's not a story, but it can be that you, you're just learning boys will be boys. <laughs> and there was a, the way of the uh, sexual promiscuity, the objectification of the body, the self objectification, because we do it to ourselves. Um, how do you think that could work like, in a post age society where like, we don't have to do that to ourselves anymore? We don't have to like, use be boys, do the boys, and we won't be fully civilized without women, but be able to be civilized? Well, I. I do think we need, I do think that, when well, there's a lot in your question, <laughs> maybe I can unpack it a little bit. One of the things that the reparative therapists argue is that homosexuality is inherently pathological. That the reason, for example, why there are high rates of sexual promiscuity among gay men is because they're gay. And homosexuality is such a malfunction that no satisfying sexual relationship can be sustained because you're gay. It's a very important part of their argument. The basic objection to that is, well, if that's true, why aren't lesbians completely promiscuous? Why is there nothing like the level of sexual promiscuity among lesbians, if the variable is homosexuality? And why don't you ever mention lesbians at all? You can read these reparative therapists and cure therapists, they're not, almost not interested in lesbians at all. There's like one study out of a hundred. The reason is they can't find dysfunction among lesbians that they can then retroactively ascribe to their homosexuality. My point is that by far the most important variable here is gender, not orientation. And the gay left, of course, which has abolished gender, won't listen about gender. Gender doesn't exist. Gender is a social construction. We're all post-gendered. There are no men, there are no women, there are just bodies and pleasures, etc., etc. Can't talk about this, because if they began to talk about this, they'd realize that they were undermining their entire argument. But happily, not being a member of the queer left, I can actually talk about these things. Um, it seems to me that it's pretty obvious, and you can look at whether you look at simple cultural factors or whether you look at evolutionary psychology and its factors, that male and female sexuality, in general, there are all sorts of exceptions, are, I think, configured somewhat differently emotionally psychologically. We all know this to be true. Whether this is a cultural factor or a biological factor, I think it's probably a combination of two, is neither here nor there, it seems to me. In our culture today, there's no doubt that men think differently about sex than women do. Men are much more geared to have immediate sexual objectification of other bodies, to be turned on instantly and able to have sex easily with almost disembodied sexual objectified objects, as the President of the United States has clearly shown. Uh, whereas women tend more, not always, but in general, to connect sexuality with emotion and connection and relationship. And whatever is the reason for this, it strikes me that if you were looking for at least one fundamental variable in why gay men have historically had high levels of sexual promiscuity, you simply say, not that they're gay, but that they're men. And you create a culture in which there is no restraint from women in that culture. You quadruple the possibility for male dysfunction. Um, in fact, I think it's quite remarkable that in a society which is 100% male, there isn't more sexual pathology dysfunction. I think it's remarkable, in fact, that many, many, many gay men historically and today sustain quite meaningful relationships and stable relationships and permanent relationships given what culturally and biologically is driving us toward. I think if you told straight men that they could have sex with whomever they wanted, wherever they wanted, essentially, that there would be no marriage, no social expectations for any sort of responsibility, no social consequences for sexual promiscuity, they would be exactly the same as gay men. And until there are social incentives and structures, I don't think we can expect, I think we're beginning to see, but I don't think we can expect a massive change in the way gay men are and will be, which is why I think marriage is a critical firewall, not just a firewall against our own unhappiness and a way to 
root out the lack of self-esteem in young gay men especially by showing them an object, a place where they can take their love and sex and construct it positively, but a firewall against another epidemic. When you create a culture where you have freedom to have multiple partners constantly, you do, I think, lay the groundwork for all sorts of viral and epidemiological problems. You simply do. We've just gone through a catastrophe of that kind. But at the same time, I don't think simply lecturing and saying this is bad or lying and pretending that not all of us are involved in this is going to help. Um, so I think that gay men have the problems of being men. We have the problems of being men in a culture where this particular kind of man is given no incentives for stability or monogamy or responsibility. And the problems of being men in such a way that we've been told from the earliest times to be ashamed of ourselves and guilty, so have lots of self-esteem issues as well. You add all that together, the culture that we have created and sustained is a miracle, in my opinion. We should be proud of it. But we need to do more. And marriage, I think, is the critical institutional relic that we need to build at the end of this experience. Uh, you know, I say in the book, the, I'm not equating these two things and never would exactly and, exa and precisely, but out of the Holocaust came the state of Israel. What is going to come out of our horror? What are we going to build from this? What are we going to take from this? What better legacy than an institution which can both make us happier better people and also healthier people in the long run. And I think that's what marriage is. It's not about punishing gay men or civilizing them or making them heterosexual. It's about making us more fully human, less ashamed, and more able to channel what is great about sex and what is great about love into something that can last. And I see those two things as very closely related. Plague and marriage, plague and marriage. I think they came out Marriage came out of this experience for a good reason, psychologically and politically. And I urge anybody here and anybody watching to please give money to the Hawaii campaign, which is going to be coming to a crescendo November 3rd. There's a website, human rights campaign website. You can send money through your credit card to institute marriage in America for the first time in the next two or three weeks. All right, a little plug. I should have had 1-800-Hawaii down here. Yeah. Could you spend a few more minutes talking about the meaning of the word undetectable? Because based on the passages that you've read today, it seems as though one of the sad uh, but defining characteristics of friendship is not really recognizing its value until you stand at your friend's bedside. Um, or the words that remain unspoken in the form of the letter that, that your friend was about to send to you. I didn't. Yeah, I think, I think that part of this is to do with Rousseau. <laughs> to get, I, I think that the ancient and medieval worlds totally understood friendship. Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, there's a passage on Aristotle here which I insist is comprehensible. Um, he has a book on ethics, the Nicomachean Ethics, which is really his disquisition on human behavior. There are ten books in the Nicomachean Ethics. Two of them are about friendship. There is not a sentence about romantic love. Now, Aristotle is coming from the point of view where women are basically inferior creatures, so he, you've got to take that into consideration, that he didn't understand, as we have come to understand, that marriage can be a great form of friendship. Um, but somewhere in the late 18th century, we changed. We decided that love itself, the romantic love, eros, what the Greeks called eros, is in fact the be all and end all. And I think it's related to a couple of things. And a lot of it has to do with Rousseau. I think at some point in the 18th century, with the decline of God, the death of God, people were frustrated and confused about what to replace it with. Rousseau came up with the possibility of a totalitarian society in which meaning was given to you by the state and by the ideology. Or he came up with the notion that somehow education would 
create the meaning of your life, the pursuit of the truth. But of course, he also realized that that wasn't really available to many people because anybody can get there. They just don't have the intellectual uh, cojones to get into that kind of place. And so he had a third option, which is that meaning can be given to everybody's life by falling in love. That's what La Nouvelle Eloise, the great Rousseauian novel, is about. So love in a modern democracy, in a place which has no God, which is not totalitarian, which has no powerful religion, is our civic religion. Love is what will make us whole. And romanticism as a movement really begins there with Rousseau and then develops in the 19th century and 20th centuries. And now that we've seen the hideousness of what the totalitarian option is, it's even more important. I remember seeing the movie Armageddon this summer, which was a high cultural moment in my life. Um, and, uh, well, anything with Ben Affleck in it. Anyway, I went to see Armageddon. Actually, and Bruce Willis was in that too. Anyway, I went to Armageddon and it just struck me that here is a movie where this band of people save the earth from complete destruction. This guy, Ben Affleck, saves the world by a heroic act and survives and comes back. But his life is not complete unless he also falls in love. I'm thinking, what greater indication of the sort of way in which our culture says love is important? A man is not worthy or noble, or his life doesn't mean anything, even if he saves the whole world but doesn't have a girlfriend. And a lot of our culture is about promoting that possibility and saying if you don't have that possibility and don't have that relationship, then essentially you should be unhappy. You are unhappy. Well, a lot of people don't have it and they're perfectly happy. And part of the problem with their depression is that they keep being told they're not. Their life somehow should be meaningless. Um, <clears throat> but the truth is, in reality, people are living lives increasingly dependent on friendship, not love. They marry later. They divorce. Um, there's much more intermingling. The women's movement, I think, and feminism, I think, in some ways, the greatest achievement of feminism is the expansion of the possibilities of friendship for human beings. Because what it has done, by creating the possibility, for the first time, really, of greater autonomy and freedom for women, and also understanding that men and women can relate on equal terms, has actually made friendship possible between men and women, for the first time, I think, on a mass scale in human history, which is an astonishing achievement and something that feminists should be much more interested in talking about. Women among themselves have always had this enormous capacity for friendship, I think, and gay men have too, partly because we've been denied marriage. Um, but straight men increasingly, and I think, have a terrible, terrible time constructing friendships that they are not panicked about. They always have to be doing something when they're together in case someone might construe the possibility they might actually be just spending time with one another. I mean, how many times do heterosexual men go out to dinner with each other? Um, they're terrified. And that's another reason I think that the hatred and fear of homosexuals plays into this, which is why the friendship subject is related at some level with homosexuality, because I think that Homophobia and the fear of homosexuals has actually restrained straight men's capacity for friendship, inhibited them, made them afraid of it. And they need it, and they would benefit enormously from it, which is why the campaign to destigmatize homosexuality is not a campaign for gay liberation alone. It is also a campaign for straight liberation. It's a campaign to allow men to have friendships that are real and deep and emotional. And what do you think Promise Keepers is about? Promise Keepers is about friendship. It's about having bonds that these straight men can live with and enjoy and feel proud of and not ashamed of. But even there, they're so afraid that they have to only have those sort of touchy-feely emotional friendships in the context of a brutally homophobic ideology. Because it has to be, the closer you are in that context, the more emphatic you have to be that you're not gay. And that also, I think, is, is to do with many of the organizations that you see in the world that are all male or have intense opportunities for male-male bonding, like the military or the church, for example, that it's those organizations where the capacity for real friendship among men is the greatest, that there has to be the most brutal enforcement of homophobic ideology. What a shame. What a loss. 
I think we need to reach out to straight men and straight women to show that what we are fighting for is what will make their lives more rich and deep. So undetectable. I mean, I think we've, we've, we've lost it in our public ideology. Um, and you really do have to go back to Augustine, Cicero, Elred of Ribot, this fantastic 10th century monk in Northumberland that I came across. But if, you've, if you have ever been a monk, you will know about, but if you have never been a monk, he'll, he'll sound as obscure and as funny as his name. Um, beautiful, beautiful treatise called De Spiritali Amicitia, about spiritual friendship. And Christianity, too. <laughs> you know, this phrase of Jesus, the most, one of the most famous phrases that you, that you have in the gospel, no greater, man, no greater love hath man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. It's one of the most beautiful lines of St. John's Gospel. And you've heard it a million times if you've gone to church a million times. And what do we remember? We remember the love, the sacrifice, the death. What we don't remember is what he did it all for. His friends. Not for humanity, not for a principle, not for his country. But he laid down his life for his friends. And you look at Jesus' life in the Gospels and you see, who is he with? Is he with his family? No. Is he married? No. He is with friends. And then that ultimate friend, um, John, the beloved, his closest friend, who writes the gospel uh, in defense of Jesus' uh, life. And I think the meaning of that, the meaning of love in the gospels is very closely related to the meaning of friendship. It's great having a gallery next to a fire station. <laughs> um, I think that's been the modern Christian churches have become so obsessed with family. Family, for much of the religious right, is the almost defining content of their theology. Even as a kid, as a Catholic, we would grow up and there'd be a great deal made about the Holy Family, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. There was a Holy Family, although you read the Gospels, it's hard to find anything about them because there's about four sentences at the beginning of most of them describing their relationship. And most of the descriptions are Jesus telling them to disappear and go away. Um, the famous visit to the temple where he tells his mother, who's scared silly about him, he's disappeared. He upbraids her and says, do you not know I have to be about my father's business? You know, This is a 13-year-old, allegedly. Um, if you open your eyes to the Gospels, I think you see that friendship is absolutely integral to the notion of what love is. Absolutely integral to what the Christian notion of what love is. And yet, we hardly think about it. You look at popular culture, you know, they said unpersuasively that Seinfeld was the show about nothing. That was the great cliche about Seinfeld. It's not about nothing, it's about friendship. It's obviously about friendship. That's the, that's the theme of every single show. And the last episode when they're sitting in a cell together what do they have left? They're in prison, but they have each other. They are crazy about each other. And it doesn't have anything to do with sex. In fact, sex has to be off the mat for there in order to be friendship. Uh, it's about equality and difference and acceptance. Um, and I think it's, and the ancients thought, and I think the great Christian theologians understood it to be the highest form of human relationship imaginable. Let's have one last, and then we'll go back to reading the last little bit. Yeah. In your uh, passages that you read, you gave an indication as to where you see the breakwater between friendship and romance involved, being like the sense of space or the spiel rock. Um, in, your last, in your last answer, you seem to be on the road from Roy to Franco. That's Roy to who? To Franco. In, in terms of, of friendship providing meaning in one's life and how those strictures of masculinity in our society make that a bit complex. Can you speak to the issue of what romantic friendship can provide that, that um, normal friendship cannot provide? Where is the psychological breakwater? Where is the meaning? Romantic friendship? You mean a, sex? I mean romance, a partnership. Okay, Eros. Right. 
C.S. Lewis has a, the, the question, if you didn't hear it and didn't see it, um, is where is the boundary between eros and philia, between love and friendship? And C.S. Lewis, I think, put it best in a way in The Four Loves, which is a, a really nice, not completely persuasive, but good book. Um, at least he's tackling these subjects seriously, which is more than we can say for most other people. Um, he says the quintessential physical positioning of two lovers is two people standing, gazing into each other's eyes. And the quintessential uh, physical pose of two friends is two people standing side by side looking in the same direction. They are actually very different. I think that love is all about abandonment and self-giving. It's about power, giving it up and taking hold of it. Um, it's about passion, not reason. It's often about opposites. People are attracted to what they are not. They want to lose themselves in what they are not. Be made whole by somebody that they are not. Have that part of them completed. Friendship is about, you could reverse that in every respect. Friendship is about someone who you are like. Someone whom you share certain things with. Someone that you don't need, don't need to fill you up, as it were. Someone whom you can be without. Emerson says at some point that the quintessential nature of friendship is that you can do without it. You choose it radically. You don't need it. It's not a matter of power. It's a matter of choice and freedom. Uh, which is why I think also that the development of modern friendship, especially in Montaigne in the 16th century, and I think to some extent in Shakespeare, is actually a critical development of the notion of the individual and his ability to freely choose another individual and also freely choose another equal. And equality is also something to do with this. You see, I think that love, you can actually be love, in love with someone who is not your equal at all. Enjoy the power this person has over you. And the other person can enjoy the power he has over her or she has over him. Look at the Star Report. That is not about equality. That is about being drawn by inequality. It's being attracted by power and its abuse. Um, which is why, of course, we're very nervous in sexual relations, because we intuitively understand that enormous power is involved over human beings. Whereas friendship requires distance, equality, respect, freedom, and choice at its finest, at its highest. There are low forms of friendship and better ones. I'm talking about the ideal type here. I think unless you have that concept firmly in your head as a moral way of being, it's very hard to sustain the ethic of a liberal democracy. I think the very notion of the modern individual as a political being in a modern democracy is related to the human capacity to develop friendship. If you can't really accept someone as an equal in friendship, you can't really accept someone as an equal as a citizen. They're related. Which is why I think, as I say in this book, that friendship in some ways is the performance art of freedom. It is, it is a critical part of free citizens engaging in a private sphere. It is the private corollary to public civic equality. And when you don't have real civic equality, I think it's kind of sometimes hard to be friends, you know? That's why straight people and gay people have some, sometimes, difficulty. Because there's too much anger, too much inequality to really sustain that. Suspicion. Uh, resentment, I mean, these very human things. Which is why I think in a strange kind of way, and for other reasons too, that gay men and women have always had great friendships because I think they've understood a shared sense of disenfranchisement. My friend Chris always says that, was pointing out the other day that, that um, a friend of his who's a receptionist at one of these law firms, how many you know, law firms in Washington are receptionists? And she pointed out that the only lawyers who ever say hello to her are the gay ones. <laughs> why is that? Why do the straight men that walk in ignore the receptionist and the gay man ask her how her day was? Um, because friendship requires equality. And if you feel you're really that far above someone, you're not interested actually in friendship. You may be interested in sex. Sex is an expression of your power. 
but not friendship as an expression of equality. Um, which is, again, why I think friendship is connected with feminism in a very powerful way and needs to be reconnected to it in an important way. You need to desex feminism in that way and talk about it as a way in which we can expand the possibilities of human friendship between the genders. Uh, well, let me, let me, unless someone really wants to ask something that I've left. Um, I'll just finish um, by finishing the story that I started with and relating it to some of these themes of friendship. <clears throat> what do we tell our friends? We tell them everything. And we're not afraid of embarrassing ourselves or boring each other. After Patrick and I found ourselves in the same viral miasma, there were times when we could tell each other things I don't think we could have told anyone else. I remember lying down on Pat's bed one afternoon when he was in the middle of the worst infection he'd yet had, a brutal little intestinal parasite called microsporidium. This vicious piece of invisible biology had slowly taken over Pat's bowels and made it impossible for him to absorb any food, so he was slowly starving when he wasn't vomiting and shitting himself. Day by day, he would go through fevers in the low hundreds, and night by night, he would lie awake, drenched in sweat, unable to be fully awake, and shaken by fevers out of what passed for sleep. For the first time, I remember, he got that AIDS skull look. For the first time, the sick days began to outnumber the well days, until in those winter months of micro, we began to contemplate the thing we'd not yet been able to contemplate. And as we lay there on the bed, him under the covers, me on top of them, I asked him, what he thought death actually was. He was shivering again, and we spooned that candlewick bedspread holding our bodies inch, inches apart. I remember feeling his bones beneath it for the first time, the skeleton beginning to shape the once firm, rosy flesh of his body. I don't know, he said. I don't really know. Sometimes it seems like some blackness coming toward me, and sometimes it doesn't seem like anything. He paused, and I felt unqualified to add anything, so we lay there for a while in silence, staring at the ceiling. Me wondering if I'd asked him because I was actually curious as to what a dying man might actually think, as if he might know a little better and help me navigate what I thought was ahead of me. Or whether I asked him because somebody needed to, and no one else would dare. Well, since I was his only close friend facing the same prospect that he knew of, no one else could ask him. He shivered again, and the phone rang. But death became one more of those banalities we had in common. In the late summer of 1995, Pat was told he had to have a catheter implanted into his chest to deliver permanent doses of antibiotics to keep his infections at bay. For Patrick, it was clearly a sign of capitulation to the virus, a boundary he hated to cross. He delayed the operation until after our annual trip to his hometown to celebrate his birthday. And a few days before we went, he took three of us out to dinner. He was at Herb's and told us he decided what he wanted to do with his ashes. His lover and ex-lover told him not to be so gloomy. It was too early and too gruesome to talk about these things, but Pat persisted. There was a spot in the sea near his childhood home, he said, a dark, swiftly deepening shallow off the point where the Gulf of Mexico meets the bay, a place where he used to dive as a child. Rumor has it that sharks lurk there, and as a boy, he dared them to catch him as he plunged into the depths. It was a place his father and grandfather had known. It was where his young nephews and nieces now swam. You could see it from the modest beach house his family owned off the main road clinging to the shore. And it was where, finally, he felt at home. It was classic Pat, a place of refuge and a place of escape, a darkness that led homeward, a wild and tame place, and his. Later that night, he called me again. He was worried his lover and ex-lover weren't taking him seriously or didn't realize how important this was to him. You understand, don't you, he said on the phone in the dark. I was not, it seems, too close to find the thought of his death unthinkable. 
but not too far away to forget what he told me. Yes, I said, I understood. And I'd help make sure it happened. Promise. And something in the way he talked to me that night made me realize he thought it was a matter of urgency. Within days, we were there, pulling up to Shark's Hole in Patrick's brother's boat. We jumped in and swam. Patrick smiling above the watermark, his freckles covered in salty rivulets. And after a while, in the warm black water, we walked along the shoreline, taking in the place, watching each other watch each other, picking up seashells and traipsing our feet in the powdery white sand. Nothing remarkable happened, except for one odd thing. A little way ahead of us on the beach, a wounded seagull lay, flapping its wings in distress, making desperate little scratch marks in the sand. As we got closer, we saw what was wrong. A small fish had gotten stuck in its craw. Out of its beak, the head of the fish and the tail stuck out together, side by side. The fish's body bent double inside the bird's gullet, causing the gull to choke and panic. A small trail of blood ran down its neck as Pat's brother, Dusty, held it down with a piece of driftwood, and Pat tugged gently at the fish's tail, tugging again and again with increasing force until the fish was finally disgorged and the gull, bewildered and liberated, flew away low over the ocean. The day of the funeral was a typically muggy one in Patrick's hometown. Our mutual friend Elaine and I had gotten up before dawn in New York to make the journey down, and in Atlanta, we pick up the rest of his close friends for the final leg home. By the time we arrived at the spacious family house Pat had grown up in, we were ragged at the edges and still in a kind of emotional haze. Those few days since his death had been black ones, tenuous, strung out affairs, places without many recognizable refuges and no discernible meaning. But the numbness lifted during the short car ride to the small town church, past rows of neighbors on the streets, and bustling silence in the crammed pews. Pat's high school portrait was propped up on the altar, an airbrushed oil work that seemed as unreal as his death. So strange to be where he'd taken us, but for the first time without him. So strange to feel the eyes of a small town bear down on the huddled suit of special, huddled, huddle of suited special friends who'd come to pay their respects. And after the wake, his family took us down to the boat. It was late afternoon, and we were doing what he'd asked of us. There were five friends on the boat, and Pat's parents, three brothers, and their wives. We brought the ashes with us, some poems to read out loud, a trumpet to play a strain from Mahler, and of course, some food. We knew where we were going, but dreaded the moment when the boat's engine would stop and we will be floating there in silence above the warm, dark gulf of Shark's Hole, waiting at last to say goodbye. I must have imagined a scene like this a dozen times over the previous few years, but it seemed even heavier than I anticipated, even emptier than I had feared. Still, there was something about the warm, gentle air that evening and the red, incandescent sky that leavened the atmosphere. So when the time came to empty the ashes into the still water, it was easy to be distracted by how white they were, like powdered sugar, and how they billowed so swiftly out behind the boat into the bay. We all stood there, watching the white clouds spread beneath us, wondering what to do next, when one of Pat's brothers started to take his shirt off. I'm going in, he yelled, and jumped in after Pat. The rest of us hesitated for a moment and then followed. I remember the shock of warmth as my body fell into the sea and the strange gray mist that surrounded me as I opened my eyes in the water and the pure sweet breeze that greeted me as I reached the surface and looked around me again and breathed suddenly for air.
Thanks. I'll sign books for anyone and anything um, afterwards, right here. So, thanks for coming. Andrew Sullivan is a senior editor of the New Republic magazine. He also writes a weekly column for the Sunday Times of London. 
His latest book, Love Undetectable, is published.